By the 1820s, the international slave trade had been prohibited by the U.S. and most of the European nations. Because it was so profitable, however, it continued almost unabated despite the new laws. Along the coasts of Africa and the Americas, British and U.S. ships patrolled for illegal slave traders. The slave traders were aware of the patrols. A ship found breaking the slave ban treaty would be seized. The punishment for the crew would be death. The cargo on this voyage was human beings. 53 Africans, including four children, brutally abducted from their homelands, were now chained together in the hold of the ship. The name of this schooner was La Amistad. One of the shackled men refused to be held down. His given name was Singbe Pei, but the men who bought him as a slave called him Joseph Singke. Singke's daring and strength rallied the captive Africans. On a moonless night, as the schooner was anchored offshore, the Africans seized control of La Amistad in a bloody revolt. These innocent men and children, unable to communicate, faced an almost impossible struggle in a strange land. A land itself in turmoil over an issue the Africans came to represent, slavery and the freedom of all human beings. In the Americas, the Europeans initially attempted to enslave the native peoples, the people they called Indians. So the North American natives were vulnerable to many diseases the Europeans carried. Hearing of these problems, the Catholic Church moved to prohibit the enslavement of the indigenous American people. Pressured by the Church and for their own economic reasons, Spain and Portugal formally agreed to end the enslavement of Native Americans. This very same treaty targeted Africans for slavery in the New World. The national slave trade was, of course, uh, one of the most lucrative commercial ventures. 15% of all Africans kidnapped would become slaves in the United States. Most of the Africans that began to be brought in were brought in from ag large agricultural settled societies. In fact, for instance, in places like South Carolina, they began to import Africans from particular places because they brought with them a knowledge of rice agriculture. Most of the Africans shackled together on the Amistad were Mindy. Hundreds of Africans were herded onto ships, shackled together two by two. Middle Passage has become synonymous with the unspeakable, inhumane treatment of captive Africans on the transatlantic voyages. Sinke survived the Middle Passage on a Portuguese slaver named the Tecora. The building of slave ships was a thriving industry and the ships were built to accommodate as many people as possible. Most decks were about four feet high, which only allowed a person to squat. On one British ship, the Brooks, a specific space was allowed for each person. Men, for instance, were granted a space six feet long, 16 inches wide, and only two feet seven inches high. By law, in 1788, the Brooks was restricted to sail with only 454 Africans in the decks below. These transatlantic voyages, sometimes three to four months long, traveled along the equator. This produced copious perspiration so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died. Olada Equiano, former slave. The holes were infested with lice, fleas, and rats. Often in mid-passage, crews discovered a shortage of provisions. To ensure enough food for the rest of the voyage, the crew would simply throw some of the Africans overboard. Sharks closely followed the ships. By the 1820s, the international slave trade had been prohibited by the U.S. and most of the European nations. Because it was so profitable, however, it continued almost unabated despite the new laws. Along the coasts of Africa and the Americas, British and U.S. ships patrolled for illegal slave traders. 
the slave traders were aware of the patrols. A ship found breaking the slave ban treaty would be seized. The punishment for the crew would be death. Done to prevent identification of illegal cargo slaves um, by uh, one, either preventing the boarding of the ship or two, uh, getting rid of the cargo. And so a lot of these ships were fitted so that their hulls would open up. And if one of the ships was about to be boarded, the cargo, uh, the human beings, would be dumped into the, into the ocean. Uh, in order to prevent uh, their detection. The price of each man was $450. After completing his middle passage on the Tekora, Sinke was hustled off the ships with the other Africans and locked into a holding pen along the Havana Harbor. The captives were fattened up, cleaned, and marched to the slave market in Havana. We thought by this we should be eaten by these ugly men. Sinke worried about their fate. Unbeknownst to their captors, the Africans decided to establish a leader to organize their escape. They had voted and Sinke was chosen. He decided to act. Finding a loose nail, he used it to pick the lock on his chains. Once free, Sinke immediately released his friend Grabo. Believing they would die anyway, the two men decided to die fighting for their freedom. The Amistad is not, you know, abnormal. That is that it's part of a long continuum, a long tradition of resistance. Many slave ships carried insurance against loss from death and disease during the Middle Passage. Insurance covering revolts and rebellions on the ships was also an option. Revolt insurance was a, a major part of the insurance industry. Lloyds of London, for instance, was a major participant in insuring slave voyages, and it's one of the ways that it built itself up as a major insurance company. The judge decided to wait until the next meeting of the U.S. Circuit Court in Hartford to bring the matter to trial. Then he would decide and rule if the blacks should stand trial for mutiny and murder. Two days after the Amistad reached New London, Judge Andrew T. Judson conducted a hearing on the Washington to determine the Amistad's status. Judge Judson had a reputation among some as a racist. A few years earlier, he led the fight against a white teacher in Canterbury, Connecticut, who opened a school for freed black girls. Present during the hearing on the U.S. Washington was Dwight P. Jaynes, an abolitionist from New London. He overheard Ruiz and Montez admit the captives were recent arrivals from Africa and realized that slave trading laws had been broken. He quickly wrote a letter to Roger Sherman Baldwin, a noted attorney and abolitionist. I take the liberty to write to you on a subject which I think should deeply interest the benevolent. You have seen the account of the schooner brought in here with the Negroes on board. They are to be tried for murder on the 17th of next month. It seems clear that the schooner was engaged in an unlawful business, and the blacks had a perfect right to get their liberty by killing the crew and taking possession of the vessel. Dwight P. Jaynes, Connecticut abolitionist. Jaynes sent a copy of the letter to Joshua Levitt, a New York abolitionist and editor of The Emancipator, the official paper of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Levitt, in turn, showed the letter to Louis Tappan, a wealthy New York City silk merchant and devoted abolitionist. They called a meeting in New York City of abolitionist leaders about what we can do to help these people. The meeting named an Amstag committee composed of Joshua Levitt, Simeon S. Jocelyn, and Louis Tappan. Within two days, they were printing flowers and asking for money, donations, for the defense of these Africans. Several friends of human rights have met to consult upon the case of these unfortunate men. All the necessary means to secure the rights of the accused. It is intended to employ three legal gentlemen of distinguished abilities and to incur other needful expenses. The undersigned make this appeal to the Friends of Humanity to contribute for the above objects. The Amistad Committee. By 1839, the fight to end slavery was a serious movement. 